Shalom and blessings to you. Saints, I greet you in the name of our Father, in the name of our Father, Yahweh, the self-existing one, the one who was not created by any man, nor the figment of any man's imagination, the only true and living God. We welcome you. I do welcome you to this broadcast as we gather here today to share in another moment of fellowship. Kindly indicate as you join whether you can see me and you can also hear me clearly. That is very important to me and to the quality of the stream that I would like us to have. I bid you Shalom. I see those of you coming uh, joining us pretty early today. Shalom and Shalom speaks of that peace that Yahweh gives to us, that confidence that we have, that it is always well. I am certainly instructed to remind you on a consistent basis, thank you for the feedback, that it is always well with the saints. Saints should never have moments in their lives when they believe or they are convinced that they are abandoned, they are forsaken, and they are no longer saints of the Most High Yahweh. You are supposed to be convinced at all times that everything that happens in your life happens according to a divine plan according to Yahweh's will, for nothing can befall a saint unless it is permitted by the God we serve. And for that I rest, and by that I rest on Shalom. Devra, Shalom and blessings to you, baby. So much love to all of you, Brother Ronald, and all the, those of you joining. Of course, you know that you can uh, let those who are normally here with us know that we are here. Some persons are still not receiving, receiving notifications, so let them know that we are here. But it is well. It is always well. It doesn't matter what you face. Um, it doesn't matter what situations people try to make you alarmed by. It is always well. The trials that we face, the tests that we face, the sufferings that we endure, about that we'll speak today. None of these things should amount to us thinking that it is not well. Shalom and blessings. Shalom. We must abide. We must rest. We must be continuously convicted that it is always well. <laughs> we have the same glasses now. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> shalom, shalom, shalom. For what, for what are you suffering? And the extension of that question is, are you even suffering? To some of you I will speak. And let me at the onset here be, be very clear that this is not intended to in any way cause saints to go looking for trouble. Just to say, oh, hey, hello, I'm in trouble, I'm a saint, I'm being persecuted. That is, that is not the purpose of this conversation. The purpose of this conversation, exhortation, and, and, and to some extent, yet another instance of warning, is to cause you saints, mommy, shalom, the heart, is to cause you saints to know that there will always be a time there will be a moment, and if ever that moment arises where you are tested in certain ways, there is an expected response. That's what this broadcast is about. There is an expectation, a holy expectation. Holy means different, consecrated, you set apart. So the saint's response to that picture we're about to speak today has to come from a holy place. Do not go looking for trouble just to say that you're suffering. However, when, not if, when that time of testing comes to you, what would be? What would be your response? Sister Daya and Shalom and to all of those joining, Shalom to you. First Kepha chapter 4, reading from verse 12. First Kepha chapter 4. Reading from verse number 
Kasimel's literature and that. Shalom, shalom, and blessings to those who are joining. Dear friends, keep his writing. Dear friends, do not regard as strange the fiery ordeal occurring among you to test you. Do not regard as strange the fiery ordeal. Fiery. Not not calm, not cool, not quiet. When Kiefer wrote this letter to, to the Hebrew people who were in the diaspora, they were not enduring anything close to what we would have to face as saints. There wasn't social media. There was nothing called cyberbullying. There was nothing called people launching all kinds of vicious, crazy um, attacks in very various ways against them. They were suffering basically physically. And he said, do not find it strange or do not consider it strange the fiery ordeal occurring among you to test you. The test that you face as saints or the fire that you are in as a saint is merely a test. Yahweh tests you by fire. Yahweh is ensuring, Don, good to see you, shalom and blessing. Charlene, good to see you as well. Yahweh tests his people through fire. Yahweh destroys the wicked by fire. If ever you are in fire and your thought process is that you are being destroyed, you need to search to find out whose spirit you possess. Those who possess the spirit of Yahweh do not become alarmed by fire. For fire does not destroy the righteous. Fire is only intended to destroy the wicked. Apostle Josh, Shalom, Brother Arbi, Shalom to those of you joining. Fire does not destroy the righteous. Fire purifies and tests the righteous. Fire proves the righteous to be pure. I feel like preaching already. Fire proves the righteous to be pure. Fire destroys the wicked. If you are a saint and you face any fiery situation and you begin to question whether you are saved, you have a problem. Those who possess the spirit of truth are never alarmed by fire. We are alerted by it. Whenever it comes our way, we know, okay, this situation right here before me, this is intended to prove what I am. This is intended to demonstrate to those who have me in the fire. This intent is intended to prove to them that I'm righteous. Shalom, my son, Quincy, and others. Shalom to all of you. We as saints are never supposed to be hollering, screaming, running, and crying because of fiery situations. These are all tests to prove, hallelujah, who we are. He said, do not consider it to be something that's strange. As if something extraordinary were happening to you. Verse 13 of First Kepha chapter 4. Rather, to the extent that you share the fellowship of the Messiah's sufferings, to the extent that you share, what's this? To the extent that you share the Messiah's sufferings. Oh, glory. To the extent that you share the fellowship of the Messiah's sufferings. Rejoice! So that they, so that you will rejoice even more when His Shekinah is revealed. Rejoice to the extent. So the more you suffer like Messiah Yeshua, the greater should be your rejoicing. The more you suffer in similarity, in comparison to Messiah Yeshua, the more you ought to rejoice. When Shaul was in prison, remember him? 
he was singing. Why? Because he was close to the suffering of Messiah Yeshua. Shalom, shalom. The closer you are to the suffering, when you examine what you are enduring in this earth, and you realize that what I'm suffering here, my Messiah suffered the same thing or a little worse than this, we begin to rejoice. Because you ought to rejoice to know that you are counted worthy of enduring something similar to that which Yeshua HaMashiach endured. The saints walk on this earth is not supposed to have rejoicing over you having a car, I got a little money, I got somebody to like me today, I got a love, I got 10, 20 likes on Facebook. No, no, no. Your purpose for walking this earth is to shine. And once you are shining in the earth, you will suffer for being one who glows. For as long as you are shining in this earth, you will suffer for being one who glows. Oh, my question to some of you today. Two of some of you are going to have a warning from me yet again and an exhortation. My question is, or my statement to you is, if you are not suffering for standing for righteousness sake, it means you are not glowing as a righteous person. You are dull. You're dim or you're dark. There's no light coming from you. We must rejoice to know that when the glory of Yeshua is revealed, we will see clearer why we suffered and how much like him we've always been. It is such a, be a beautiful thing to know that as the world tells you all of the most dangerous, deadly, nasty, wicked, mean things that Jesus while I'm talking about here. You are able to glow knowing that the Pharisees, the scribes, the Yehudim, we call them Judeans, they all hated Yeshua HaMashiach. The people who claim to be of Yahweh hated Messiah more than the wicked. Oh, come let me help you all with this. Come and let me help you if I can. They captured, or the, the high priest, sent for Yeshua HaMashiach to be arrested. Some of you all need to come and hear this very clearly. They took him before the Romans. Watch this. The Romans did not send for Messiah. The Romans didn't go looking for Messiah to kill him. It was those who kept the feasts. It was those who, who read the law. It was those who felt that they were Yahweh's people. It was those who felt that they were so righteous. In today's society, you call them the church ones. The Romans did not go looking for Yeshua HaMashiach. When Shaul was persecuted, he was told prophetically that your own people will take you and hand you over to the Romans. On an ordinary day, Heathens have nothing to do. What you call heathens, don't bother me. On an average basis, the most terrible things that are said about me do not come from the mouth of those who Jesus will call sinners. The most vile and wretched, slanderous rumors that I've heard about myself didn't come from people on the street, heathens. It came from Jesus people like Gary Mingo and them. I want you to think on that. Process that carefully about where your greatest source of hatred comes from. Even Yeshua the Messiah was not sought after by the Romans. He was taken to Pilate and Pilate was commanded, forced to execute. 
But Pilate said, I don't see anything, anything wrong with this man. And that's exactly what you are living as a saint. Where sometimes the sinners, as they classify in the world, would hear of your situation, tell the church, Jesus one, no, what you see with that person isn't so. I found them to be quite different. Even on your job, you experience that. Where the Jesus one wants to set you up and the one they call a sinner says, no, this isn't right. We're not going to do it this way. It's amazing. There is a glory that is to be seen or revealed, the Shekinah glory of Yeshua HaMashiach. And we ought to rejoice when we are suffering. For the glory came to Yeshua through his suffering. First Kepha chapter 4, verse number 14. If you are being insulted because you bear the name of the Messiah. So here again, what is the name of the Messiah? What is the nature of the Messiah? Because the name of the Messiah cannot be disconnected from the nature of the Messiah. Ooh. The name, Mama J, Shalom, and I love you so much. Blessings. The name of our Messiah cannot be disconnected from the nature of the Messiah. Watch this. Neither can it be disconnected from the culture of our Messiah. Yeshua HaMashiach has the name Yeshua because it represents a particular character and it represents a particular culture. You cannot take away his name and try to retain his culture. Neither can you take away his culture and try to keep his name. So when you bear the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, you have to bear the culture of Yeshua HaMashiach. Ooh. And the culture of Yeshua HaMashiach doesn't have anything called Mother's Day or Father's Day or Valentine's Day that the churches today in Linden and in Guyana and in the USA have on the, on, on the Bahamas. You all have all kinds of uh, uh, bouquet and, and baskets to celebrate. Mommy, you are wicked people because the culture of Yeshua HaMashiach doesn't have anything worldly in it. The culture of the Hebrew people has got Yahweh's laws, Yahweh's, Yahweh's commandments, Yahweh's principles, and Yahweh's spirit leading them. Y'all have got the nature of the Antichrist leading you. That is why you have to do what they say. You are pagans. That's what you are. You are bona fide pagans. You are wicked to the core. That is why you can easily exhibit the world's culture because you are of the world. But Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua is Hebrew. Therefore, Yeshua has Hebrew culture. Therefore, Yeshua cannot have Mother's Day or Easter or Christmas or Thanksgiving or Father's Day or Valentine's Day. Yeshua's culture is connected to who Yeshua is. You love the world because you are of the world. The world hates us because we are not of it. So you will have to join the world in hating the righteous because you are not of the righteous flock. Those of you who are in Guyana and are on social media platforms, you are very familiar with the Assemblies of God having on the 1st of May, according to Pope Gregory's calendar. Sister Corinne and Brother Chris, Shalom, they had their, 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 what they call it, Youth Ministries Convention. And in the midst of such atrocities being committed against African people, Hebrew people, Raphael Messiah, John Smith, Winston Asana, all y'all have your finale come there and your finale could stand and speak. Well, I'm waiting for y'all now. I who proclaim righteousness, Apostle Cleveland Thomas who proclaims righteousness, Apostle Joshua Bissoon who proclaims righteousness and Yeshua HaMashiach, Apostle Littleton Zechariah who proclaims righteousness and Yeshua HaMashiach, 
those who are with us, like Pastor Mark, like Pastor Robert, and others who, Pastor Rickford Barkley, who proclaim Yeshua HaMashiach. You refuse. You have ordered that none of us must ever speak in a pulpit in the Adventist Church, in the Assemblies of God Church. But Erfan Ali, a Muslim, is welcomed. You are wicked. And I don't want to speak in your, by y'all anyway, because you know exactly what I tell you. I'll go on the pulpit and tell you that you're wicked. So you know you wouldn't invite me. You are certain that you would never want me to come speaking in the Assemblies of God Church because I will stand and say that you have lost in every sense of the word. Any form of identity regarding righteousness. You are, you are full blown, bona fide, or bona fide day. You are solidly cast into the world system. You wicked heathens. That's why Irfan Ali could be more acceptable to you all than me. Because you're no different from Irfan. John Smith, as old as you are, you are becoming more compromised. The closer you get to the grave, the more wicked your nature is. You could tell me that you are okay with a fan standing there who, when Darmlal was accused of burgling a little girl, you said nothing about it. When the, when the Sodomites were walking, were, were, were promoting, oh, gender neutral bathrooms at the University of Ghana, you said nothing about it. When I was standing to say, watch it, they're coming after your children, they want to go after your children. When Otis said, that he likes little boys and he has a boy for every day of the week. You said nothing about it. When Erfan Ali has Susan marrying a woman, the wedding invitation was published. You said nothing about it. And that's a minister she's called in government. Paid to be. Marrying woman, when Guyana's law prohibits any such thing, you couldn't talk. But you have Erfan on the stage. When the director of public prosecutions discontinued 19 fraudulent char fraud charges against Irfan Ali for robbing the state. You said nothing about it. When the people in Mocha Arcadia houses were knocked down and the house is over 100 feet away from the, from the highway. On the East Bank houses are sitting right beside the highway. On the real embankment where many inner people live, houses are right there beside the, the highway. But when it comes to the Mocha Arcadia area, you have to knock down all the houses and they know we're close to the highway. And Irfan said he didn't want to appear weak. You were right there. And Irfan talks about being Muslim when even his Muslim brother said he's not Muslim. He's, he commits haram too often. Haram is that which is not permitted according to Islamic law. And you, you, John Smith, you, Raphael Messiah, you, Winston Asana, you, Sir, and all of y'all could be there with Irfan, and he's happy to shake Irfan's hand and smile and show the world that, okay, the president came. The president came. The president, such a dishonest, disingenuous, semi-literate moron of a man who lies, misrepresents the truth so often, and makes a mockery of our constitution. Who has the gall to talk about false prophets? When have you ever heard? A president who tries his best to demonstrate, oh, he likes the constitution. So the constitution, they say, bears that you must have the right to religious, uh, propagate your religion. Promote it. An air finale could stand up and talk about false prophets. Who, where you have prophets? Which group, in reference to religious recognition in this country, bears prophets among them? Muslims don't talk about prophet. Only one prophet they talk about is Prophet Muhammad. Nobody else. Muslims have imams. They don't have prophets. Pandits are not prophets. So the only people who have what are called prophets is the church. And Irfan could talk about false prophets. And you all don't rebuke him. Because he could diss the church. And you all can't address him. But if you only get up to see the Irfan, the Muhammad is false, you see what I'm to you. And you all feel so important because the culture of the world is your culture. The righteous, we have a different culture. We call the wicked for what they are. Whether you're a president, you're a prime minister, there's nothing called vice president in our constitution. Should Barrett, you out the equation. You are Barrett. Whether you're a president, you're a prime minister, you're Barrett. 
If you are wicked, you are wicked. If you are the official leader of the opposition, or the unofficial leader of the, of the opposition, and you're wicked, you're wicked. The righteous does not have any instruction to bow to wicked leaders. Because Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua is the name we bear. Apostle T. Shalom, my brother, blessings. Yeshua is the name that we bear. We have a different culture. Our culture says that if you're wicked, you can't be called righteous. Our culture says that you cannot call that which is good evil. And you cannot call that which is evil good. Or woe be unto you. Oh, John Smith and Raphael. Woe be unto you, Asan. Asan, you're always a puppet anyway. You're always a weakling. So woe be unto you is just an understatement. You all cannot even stand for anything righteous and, and rebuke that wicked man for what he is. A young woman is on record of pleading for help. And he couldn't let the man who she accused with so much detail. He couldn't even instruct that man to get out of office. Sit down. Because your name is disgusting in my ear. He couldn't do that. Yeshua HaMashiach, 1st Kepha chapter 4, verse number 14 reads, If you are being insulted because you bear the name of the Messiah. What is the name of the Messiah? There has to be some name attached to this, this, this term Messiah. The Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, HaMashiach. What is his name? There has to be some name attached to this person. What's his name? We are being insulted because we bear the name of the Messiah. He said, how blessed are you? How blessed are you if you are insulted for bearing the name of the Oh, glory of the Messiah. Hallelujah. You are a blessed person when you are being insulted for bearing the name of Yeshua. You hear that? Do you hear that? You are, you are being insulted, he said. For bearing the name of the Messiah. Then you're a blessed person. Not when you have a house. Not when you have the car. Not when you have promotion in your job. Not when your husband treats you good. Not when your wife treats you bad. Not when your children are nice. You are, you are blessed when men speak all manner of evil things against you. You are blessed. And you are highly favored when you bear the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. I am asking you today, what are you suffering for? Because if you can't suffer for righteousness sake, you're suffering for something else. And if the wicked do not hate you, it's obvious that you're also wicked. You are just a well-behaved wicked person who says Yeshua sometimes. But you accept Jesus at all times. You are wicked in your hypocrite. The same people who hate me for standing so resolutely and telling them that Jesus is an absolute European trash and you ought not to believe in nonsense. They love you. Isn't that something strange? Isn't it unique? The scripture records the letter to the, to the Hebrew people who was scattered throughout the world from Kepha, records that you are blessed. You are blessed when they insult you because you bear his name. Glory, hallelujah. You first, Kepha chapter 4, verse number 14. If you are being insulted, I quote, because you bear the name of the Messiah, how blessed are you? How blessed are you? Ooh, when they say that you, 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 you have got this whole, this, this new thing in your head and you're brainwashed. How blessed are you? When it can be said 
that you suddenly begin to follow this man London. And suddenly Jesus is, is, is to be disrespected by you. And look at how you suddenly become. You think you're different. How blessed are you? When they consider you so stupid for following after the man, you're in a cult. How blessed are you? How blessed are you when they consider you the right? I'm a, you're a London girl, you're a London boy. Grown man like you falling after the man, you, you don't got sense. How blessed are you? When they can remind you of how much you loved Jesus and now you say Jesus is European trash. How blessed are you when they can call you stupid for walking in righteousness? How blessed are you? When your children can rise up against you for standing for righteousness. How blessed are you when your spouse can look at you and despise you because you stand for righteousness. You are a blessed person. Do you realize how happy a man, how joyful a man I am, the more the world hates me? <laughs> yeah, some of y'all don't get it. I am one of the happiest creatures you'll ever find. You know why? Because on a daily basis, the world, I'm talking about the Jesus world, express their hatred for me. And I love it to the core. Oh, glory. I am, I am, listen, the day I see Jesus people, especially not the, not the followers so much, but those on the pulpit, the day I see these preachers start telling me how much they love me and how, how, how upright I am as a man. And, and, and they, they know that I speak the truth. I would start hollering and crying and repenting to heaven. I'm so sorry, Yahweh. I know I did something wrong. I know that I am going to hell if these people here say I'm righteous and like me. That's how I live. I get fuel from being hated by the wicked people in the pulpit. You pulpit pimps. You popcorn of preachers. Y'all are so soft. Yet again, there's another another complaint against the same damn lal and y'all can't talk. And what's amazing is damn lal he's Christian now. You have seen it. You have seen it that in the People's Progressive Party I'm talking to y'all again first. Out of every single member, every single vote as to whom will be the head of the PPP, there is zero Hebrew face in it. Not one black face, as you call it. And John Smith cannot call out the glaring racism and hypocrisy presented by the PPP. Because you cannot be loud. If wicked voices whisper treats and whisper what what Sam and me just talk about opportunities to you. You cannot be loud when the wicked voices can whisper in your ear. Just 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 um let's take the photographs to the president and we we'll have some land for you. We'll give you an offering. We'll help to build some little you'd center you want to have built. When you cannot speak, it's obvious that favors have silenced you. When you cannot speak for righteousness, it is obvious that favors have silenced you. I could holler as loudly as I want. Because Irfan doesn't give anything to me. And if I have to go based on his, his capacity, where he sits as a president of this country, we pay to do so, I will speak to him as a Guyanese with the right to have what I want. Not asking for a favor. But those compromised crosses you have leading these churches in this country. You all can hate me all you want because I'm telling you the truth about you. You're wicked. You're pimps in the pulpit. All you need is a, is a shoe like what Irfan wore at the, at the, at the, at the PPP convention. All you need is, is the shoe the, the the glittering shirt and the bright red jacket the hat you're a full blown pimp can't even tell people the truth but those of us 
who bear the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we are blessed. Glory, hallelujah. We are blessed when you insult us. Whoo! It's such a blessing. Saints, you need to learn to rejoice when even your spouse tells you that you're wicked. Rejoice when even your spouse says that you're so stupid for following after the, 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 these men. It's a blessing when they can look at you and say all manner of evil things against you, said Yeshua, for his name's sake. So let me read that again for you. If you are being insulted because you bear the name of the Messiah, how blessed are you? Watch this. For the spirit of the glory or of the Shekinah, that is the spirit of Yahweh is resting on you. When do they insult you? When the spirit of Yahweh is resting on you. Oh, glory, let me preach. The insults can only come when they can see something on you that they can't find in them. The reason why the, the assemblies of God and the Adventists and the Baptists and all y'all have to hate me so much is because you can see in me, I'm talking to y'all who lead the church now, you can see in me what you could never possess, which is what you call chutzpah, courage, strength and fortitude, righteousness on my lips, you wicked pimps. You jelly back, jelly bean, lollipop preachers. You're afraid of everything that moves. There's a Shekinah. There's a glory of Yahweh that rests on saints that you cannot hide. Even if you want to hide, there's a degree of righteousness that rests on you and His Spirit is on you that the world knows. Even the wicked can look at you and see that you are not an ordinary person. You are just different. You are not moved and shaken and easy by anything. You have a voice when there's no one else speaking. You have courage, glory, when no one else can stand for it. You can stand alone when everybody else sits in fear. Tell me, oh, be careful. Oh, be, I always say, oh, be careful. I, oh, Jack, you could do something. Do something to who? Yahweh is my light. Don't make me preach today. Yahweh is my light. And Yahweh is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What does a little wimp, bald-headed moron? A wimpish, bald-headed bat I should be afraid of? Why? If you put me in, I told you all, and I tell you again, any man who has to have bodyguards and police force and AK-47 and AR-15 rifles to surround him and he can't stand toe to toe with me in a room, you are nothing but a fish and a hen. Whew, and you're crying harder. Whew! I must be afraid of you. When I can walk through the valley, of the shadow of death? Why must I fear you? When you scared of me? Those who know Yahweh. Those who know their God. Shall be strong. And do exploits for him. Not be afraid and cower. Oh, I'm so scared. You are supposed to be one who carries the glory. It's written here. The glory of Yahweh. That's why they hate you. They insult you because the glory of Yahweh. It's written here. You are blessed for the spirit. The spirit of the glory of Yahweh. The glory of Yahweh. The spirit of Yahweh is resting on you. When do they insult you? When the glory of Yahweh is resting on you. When do they hate you the most? When the glory is seen the brightest. The glory of Yahweh is the, 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 the fullness of who he is. 
And when the fullness of who Yahweh is, is seen on you, boy, they get mad. They get livid. They hate your guts. But they cannot stand in your way. So the fiery darts. <laughs> Let me read what Stacy said. <laughs> Stacy said, when I asked, when I stood before the judge during the domestic abuse case, the judge said, who are you, young lady? And asked the police to pinch me to ensure it is not the ghost in the courtroom. The judge said, you should never be alive after suffering so much. Yahweh is so glorious. Hallelujah. Glory. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. We shall not be moved like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. You can't move me with your worst insult. You could find the worst thing to say about me. Find the worst rumors to spread about me. I don't care. And that's a bugs y'all. Because I don't care. Honestly, I don't care. I'm so listen. I, I even post what they say about me. Y'all see that? When one said that I was in some hotel room with him, some some Delroy, something. I was in today one of them said that I, I robbed somebody, some husband quote me, my friend, my dear brother. So I robbed him of his money and his and his son is crying on social media. You here I can say it now. You know I can say it because I don't care. That's what you have to understand. Oh, he's sleeping this one, he's sleeping the girls. He said, I don't care. You can say whatever you want to say. For I know the book. I know what's written. And I know that the more I am insulted, the more the glory is seen. So talk all you want. The worst you say about me, the brighter I will shine in the world. You see if tomorrow, if tonight, if I go on a broadcast tonight, and I say, okay, saints and brothers and sisters, enemies and friends, if and Barrett and all the puppies in the line, as of this day, I shall officially commence the march towards contesting the 2025 general elections. If I say that, if I say that, within five minutes, you will see the most prolific, efficient, masterful propaganda campaign launch against me because they know the trouble they'll be in. Oh, London is anti-man. London is a sodomite. London sex in this person. London thief this. London did that. London is a drug pusher. London thief the church money. You would see the greatest degrees of smearing. And some of you will call me and say, Apostle, I'm so concerned because these things are saying. And some of you, some of you I know will sit and say, oh, but there may be some truth to that. I know some of you very well. Not all of you. Some, just a, a minuscule number will say, hmm. <laughs> what this? But the ultimate concern for the PPP, APNU, AFC, and any odyssey you could think about is that they all know that I honestly don't care. That, that, that's what's most traumatizing for these people, that I don't care. Because the more you say evil things against me, the brighter. Did you just know say she's a spiritist? <laughs> huh? the, the more the people speak against you, saints, the brighter is the light of Yahweh's glory upon you. The more evil they call you, the more good you, are, you actually are. The more they speak about you in a wicked way, the more righteous you actually are. Because the glory of Yahweh cannot be hidden when it rests on a saint. The glory of Yahweh cannot be hidden when it rests on the righteous. The glory of Yahweh can never be hidden when it rests on the righteous. When the Shekinah of Yahweh rests on you, you begin to glow. My Lord. Arise. Shine. For your light. The light has come. And the glory of Yahweh. The Shekinah of Yahweh. Has risen. On you. You didn't say hide. And run. Darkness will cover the earth. 
and gross darkness will cover the people. But the Shekinah of Yahweh shall arise upon you. That is how the saints know who they are. And when you begin to walk in the culture of Yeshua HaMashiach, for it's recorded in scripture that everyone who is born of Yahweh is Hebrew. You're not anything else. Everyone, every individual who is saved, including the Gentiles, and I'm not a Gentile. Gentiles are not people who black. As you call it. Everyone, including the Gentiles who are grafted into the natural olive branch. You are Hebrew. That's why you, it states that you have been adopted into the commonwealth of Israel. We don't, we don't be adopted into the world system or the commonwealth of Guyana or the commonwealth of USA or commonwealth of England. When you are saved by Yahweh, you automatically become Hebrew, even if you're a Gentile. Because the only people, the only people who will be saved are those who are under that umbrella. Under that nation. Hebrew. Nobody else. So the Gentiles will be picked out from nations around the world. And you become Hebrew. Romans chapter 2 states. That you're not Hebrew by outward appearance. But by the inward circumcision of your mind. So once you are saved. Even if you are. And Shaul is writing that the Gentiles. The Romans then. And so even if you are a Roman, if you're Roman, Ashkenazi from the Caucasus Mountain, once you become saved, you are automatically grafted into the natural olive branch and you are Hebrew. You, there, you therefore change your culture. You change what you were. You become a totally different person. Fun for you is not fun in the world. Fun for you is not Christmas time. You don't go to Jesus Church to have some fun fellowship. You are a different being. You hate wickedness and you love righteousness. But the faith, shalom and blessings. The Shekinah is on you. First Kepha chapter 4 verse number 15 reads, Let none of you suffer for being a murderer or a thief or an evildoer. Uh oh, next one. Or a meddler in other people's business. As a saint, you need to learn to mind your business. I'm talking to some of your young wives here now. And probably young husbands. Learn as a saint. You must not be engaged. All day on your phone. Texting, talking. But other people's business. Learn. It is in the book. It's in the book. You must not suffer as an evildoer. As one who meddles in people's business. It's called being a busybody. Some of you young mothers need to learn. That's why I told you I don't I don't I would never have you meet Monday, Tuesday, Monday women's ministry, Tuesday, some uh, uh, prayer, something, Wednesday, girls' ministry, Thursday, men ministry, Friday, prayer meeting, Saturday, youth ministry, Sunday, fellowship in the morning, Sunday, prayer in the evening. No. Because you will I will meet you once, and that's a lot for a whole week. Stay home. You young wives, learn to deal with your house. And learn to mind your business in it. On any given day, some of you could tell the whole world somebody's business. What is wrong with you? Stay in your house. Your house isn't leaking your house in a hole. Stay inside. And if you have a hole, put an umbrella up over your head and let water run down the side and sit on that couch and relax yourself. Learn to be in your space. Hmm. 
There is direction, there is guidance, and there's counsel in the book that you must not be a busy body. <laughs> See, I'm making them cry. Some of them from time they open the eyes, they go on the phone, girl, hmm, you hear about the one in London, you hear about London, say yesterday, I know London, and I know this, and I know that, and you hear what they say about London, I know London is, and you, you would spend your whole day discussing people rather than doing something that's productive. If you make one egg ball for every name that you talk, every time you gossip, you have a big business. If you cook one pot of food for every name that you speak, you will never come out being hungry. If you make one swipe of a broom for every person you talk about, your house will be spick and span, absolutely clean. You all need to relax. Stop developing this attitude you have to talk about somebody all the time. Stop it. And I'm talking to the saints, say, stop it. Don't make that your nature. Be productive. If you, I'm saying about this, if you decide to drop one polari, boop, in the pan, in the oil, every time you want to talk about somebody, put polari in the pan. Before you know, you have a whole big bucket to go and sell the corner with sour, loud sour and pepper. Let me give you business ideas here. Instead of wasting time talking to somebody, drop one pillar in the pan, one spoon inside, inside. Or clap one roti and then stir the, stir the curry up. You go into the corner and sell it. In one year, I promise you will have almost half a million dollars in your hand and you didn't gossip with anybody. I, I can't stand young women. You young and married and all you could do is find somebody to talk about. It is not a good thing to do. Don't encourage it. And among you sins, I'm serious about this. I'm serious about this. You need to tell some of your sisters, stop. I don't want to hear about anybody. Stop it. I, I am not interested. Go do something productive. It states in the scripture that you must not be a meddler in other people's affairs. Don't meddle in it. Don't put your hand in it. Some of you don't have the qualifications to deal with it. Oh, you don't want me to go here today. You do not want me to go here today, but I will. You uh, Listen, if you do not possess any of the gifts of the Messiah, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, Neither you possess the gifts given to the church, which would be that of an encourager or one who brings comfort or one who's a giver who meets the needs of the people. You don't have any of those gifts. You don't have the gift to exhort. Listen, if you have none of those, then why are you positioning yourself to receive news about people? What would you do, what would you do with it? Worse to receive news about those who lead you. What will you do with it? How are you discussing Pastor Melly? You're not a pastor. You're not an apostle. You're not a prophet. How are you discussing elder? When you're not anywhere close to leading the church. And I think Pastor Mel did a post about that this week. It was so profound. I think I saw it. Where she spoke to people who believe things about you. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here according to what I gathered from it. When you see people say certain things about another person and, and that individual receives it or hears it, it says a lot about the one who tells the lies. Because people normally project lies outward based on what they know they're capable of doing. I had a friend. And this is an important lesson for me to teach you as the one who leads you. And even my father taught me this. I said to daddy, well, let me tell my father first, because I love him so much. When I said to daddy, because I know that I'm, I'm what they call some public figure and or whatever, or whatever title they want to give to me, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. So the, I'm this social person, I'm a public figure and all the things they want to say. And I said, daddy, what if one day on, 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 on some interview, 
um, some interviewer wants to ask me about some rumor. Who did I sleep with? There's a rumor that you was, that I, oh, somebody said that you were in some hotel with some man sometime, or somebody said you sleep with some girl or some woman. Then my father said, he said, that interview must be over immediately. You do not respond to disrespect in reference to a formal environment. You don't ever get it to say, oh, no, no, that isn't true. Never do that. My father said that to me, and I've locked it in my head for years of my life. You don't waste your time. For he said the fact that they can ask you the question shows that they believe what they heard. Let me tell you about the friend why my father's words came decades later now. Someone who was supposed to be a friend of mine came to me and he said, um, Nigel, I heard you slept with this person. That's years, years ago now. He came to find me. I said, boy, I heard that you, 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 you've been sleeping with this, this girl. That's my friend now. That's my dog, as you all say. Him. And I looked at him. I remember I did head on my road here. I said, yeah. And you came to ask me that? So you come to ask me that? Say, yeah, man, because the people talking. I said, the fact that you asked me the question means you don't deserve an answer. Because you already got the answer in your head. If you feel that I was incapable of doing it, you never asked it of me. I said, did you defend me when you heard it? He said, no, no. I, I said, I'm coming to ask him myself. I said, good. To this day, we are never close. Never close ever again in our life. Because as a young man, he noted. Now, I didn't know the whole principle. But something in me said, uh-uh, if you could be my buddy, pal, dog, whatever, and you could have the nerve to come to ask me something of a, based on a rumor, it tells me everything you think about me. And I think that that's what Pastor Mel's post was about. Now, years later, decades later, I'm talking to my father. And I said, if I'm being interviewed with somebody, some of these, 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 uh, an interviewer decides to ask me about some rumor, something. He said, the interview is over. For he said to me, the one who has invited you to interview you must have respect for you as a person. I'm presenting that to you to establish that as a young person, as an old person, as a saint, there's some things you don't get involved in. You don't, you don't get yourself involved in that and you're in your, in, in your house, you have husband and children and you in your house gossiping with other people on your phone. Don't do it. My daughters I've raised with a principle. My son I've raised with the same principle. I'm raising with the same principle. If you did not see it, it did not occur. Don't come and talk to me as if you know it happened. Say to me, it has been said. Do not ever come to me to speak about something you didn't see. And even if you saw it, ensure that that is what you saw and you understand what surrounds what you saw. For example... A man can be laying on a woman with his mouth to her mouth. Watch this. Seeking to revive her. And the rumor is, and the, the, the photograph is flashed now. They got it. They got the camera. They get a camera. Let me see if I can find my camera. Where is it? I know where it is. Boy, marvelous. They do all kinds of things. My but anyway, okay, right. <laughs> they, 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 they have the camera. Oh, oh, oh. We got it, we got it, we got it. Yeah, 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 we got him. Hear me. That man could be photographed saving somebody's life. And the rumor is he was having sex with a woman because he got caught on camera kissing the woman. That's the world in which you live. Even if you see it, ensure that you understand what surrounds it before you open your mouth. And may I hurt you a little more, some of you? Philippians, the Philippian church was told very clearly. Here's how you ought to think. 
Think on what is true. Think on what is noble. Think on what is righteous. Think on what is pure. Think on what is lovable or admirable. And if you can find virtue in it or power in it and it's worthy of praise, then that must consume your thought and become your word. What has occupied your thoughts and therefore governed your speech? The book states that to the pure, everything is pure. But to the one who is not pure, nothing is pure. Absolutely nothing. So an impure mind cannot receive a pure thought. And even if they hear a pure thought coming from your lips, they will make it impure when they begin to repeat it. Saints, you are called to be righteous. You don't function in the realm of wickedness. The book commands you as to how you ought to think. And if you are thinking on these things, it says, you know what happened to you? Then you speak it about what is noble. Your speech shall be pure. Your speech shall be righteous. Your speech shall be admirable. Your speech shall be praiseworthy. Your speech shall be powerful. Because your thought is you are consumed by what is purity. If all day you sit to think about something evil about somebody, then what you say will only be evil. The scripture, the word, the letter addressed how we ought to even think as saints. Melanie, you're not going to mind this business. You are so brilliant. The way Melanie processes, her mind is extremely sharp, boy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Melanie, sir, internet's in and out. She's not going to mind this business. <laughs> this serious business. So let's go further. Let's go deep into the text. You mustn't suffer for meddling in people's affairs. Watch this. But if any one of you suffers for being messianic, which is like the Messiah, let him not be ashamed. But let him bring glory to Yahweh by the way he bears or he wears that name. Oh, if you are going to suffer for being like the Messiah, do not be ashamed of it. You ought to have glory being brought to Yahweh for the manner in which you handle that suffering. How do I handle suffering? How do you handle suffering? Do you see me asking out for prayer? Do you see me coming to you saying that we need to have a special prayer meeting because after I'm going through so much? No! How do I handle suffering? I handle suffering by glorifying Yahweh. How? By maintaining a righteous position. When Yeshua was brought, when our Messiah was brought to trial, when our Messiah was being arrested and persecuted, he didn't back down. How do you handle suffering when you maintain a righteous position? You cannot handle suffering by becoming unrighteous. Oh, give me five minutes and me cuss them out. No! Don't tell me that you become so overwhelmed by somebody bothering you that you lose a sense of righteousness. The saint's posture is always righteousness under every circumstance. Even if you have to be angry, be angry but righteous. That's why the book says be angry but don't sin. There's something called righteous anger. And that's what George Smith and them didn't have against Ephraim Ali. I'm not mad at Ephraim Ali on a personal basis. I'm angry because he's doing what is wicked. I'm not mad at Jesus preaching because I, I don't like you. Some of us were cool. But what you're doing now, you've gone overboard. You are wicked. The minute you tell me that you know that tithe is food and you don't eat money. The moment you tell me that you know for sure that tithe is not money in any way. 
but it's always been food. But you take money, you're a pimp. You're a thief. You're a criminal. You're a crook. You're a flat foot hustler. You're a hardcore, hard back bandit. You're not my friend. You are a puss. You're a quick foot. I mean, not friends. So under any circumstance, I maintain the righteous posture. Watch this. Even if it involves my mother, my father, my sister, my brother, my wife, my children. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as a situation comes to me, I maintain a righteous posture. You aren't right because you're my wife. Or you aren't right because you're my mother. You don't try because you passed him and my sister or, or, or pastor read my, my son. No, 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 no. No. Once the matter comes before me to be dealt with, there is a righteous posture that has to be maintained. You know, later, man, you're always on time. That's all right. So, when you begin to suffer, let me ask you the question today. Are you suffering? No, not for what are you... Some of you will have to ask you the question. Are you suffering at any time? For any cause that's righteous? <laughs> I knew you came at the wrong time, boy. <laughs> are you suffering for what is righteous? When was the last time that you took a righteous position about anything, knowing that it will cost you something. When? When was the last time you said, even if they have to fire me, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this job and I would not compromise my position? When is the last time you ever spoke like that? When is the last time you ever said that even though my mother will turn against me, my friends will turn against me. My my brother, my sister, who we went to all the Jesus Church for years, will turn against me. And despite all of that, I will still walk righteously and tell the truth. When is the last time you suffered for that? When is the last time you suffered a disconnection in a relationship because you stood for what is righteous? When? Are you telling me? That your relationships are so important to you that you can have no record of one being destroyed because you took a righteous position? Are you saying to me that your relationships are so important to you that even Jesus has become so relevant that you cannot defend the cause of Yeshua and speak to it with some authority? If you're going to suffer, you must suffer knowing that there is glory to be brought to Yahweh through your suffering. And here is the painful part. For the wicked, you Jesus ones who have adopted this wicked nature, you all I'm talking to, you preachers one, I'm dealing with you now. First Kepha chapter 4 verse number 17 reads, Why must you, it's, it's a one letter, it's not a chapter and verses. Let me read verse 16 first. But and if anyone suffers, if anyone suffers, if anyone suffers for being messianic, let him not be ashamed. Watch this. But let him bring glory to Yahweh by the way he bears this name, which is the name of Yah Yeshua. Look, look at this now. For time has come, for the time has come for judgment to begin. Oh, I'm awake now with y'all. Do you see why you mustn't be ashamed? Because judgment has begun. It begins with the household of Yahweh first. Oh, glory. Judgment. Now, Kiefer wrote this hundreds upon hundreds of years ago. Over 1,700 more and more years ago. This has been written. Close to 2,000 years, this has been written. I'm here to announce to y'all that if Kiefer said that judgment must begin what's happening now and he said where it must begin 
It must begin in the household of Yahweh. Woo. So when you're suffering, it mustn't be for an evildoer. Because if you're suffering as an evildoer and a busybody who always talking somebody's business, then judgment is coming to you in the house. All right, watch this. When Yahweh at Passover told Israel, go into the house, hide in the house, put the blood on the, on the doorpost, on the lentils. When I see the blood, I'll pass over your house. That's why the feast is called Passover. Come on, y'all, wake up here. Now he said, Passover has been met. Now I am coming in the house to find you. I hope you're alive and awake this afternoon. At Passover, he passed over the house. Now that the spirit is in the house, he said, I'm coming to look for you. I'm coming inside to find you. And if you're suffering, suffer not as an evildoer. Don't suffer as one who was in somebody's business, who always has a busybody around the place. Don't suffer as a thief. Don't take your stuff and want to hide and duck. He said, I am coming to find you. For judgment must begin. In here. Have you ever heard? Let me close my Bible here. Have you ever heard? Or have you taken note of the fact that don't judge, don't judge, don't judge? Okay, Mel, I'll see you soon. Have you have you been paying attention to people telling you don't judge? Sandal Shalom, have you? Have you all noticed that whenever you decide to say, speak about anything or speak to anyone, they tell you don't be judgmental? I'm talking to saints in the church, by the way. I'm speaking to those of y'all who say you believe in Yeshua, you believe in Yahweh, you follow me, I'm your leader, I'm your dad, I'm your pastor, I'm apostle is my apostle, apostle is my dad. Have you, have you heard in your circle that as soon as somebody begins to address your foolishness, you, you, who's supposed to have the name Yeshua attached to you, could tell somebody they're being judgmental? If the time has come for judgment to begin in the household, why are you saying don't judge? You, Jesus, devils, now let me go outside and talk to you. Why y'all are so cautious now about judging anybody? Judge not. You run to Matthew who said, oh, judge not, lest you be judged. That's not what he said. Because the time has come for judgment to be in the house. So how could the scripture declare that judgment Judgment must begin in the house. And you end up saying, don't judge. You've just been exposed to what you are. Because if you're in the house, then judgment has to begin in the house. And who are we judging? Who are we judging? If judgment must begin in the household of Yahweh, who are we judging? Those on the outside? No! The book is clear. Show to the Corinthians saints that we pull down strongholds and every imagination and every vain thing that seeks to exalt itself against the knowledge of Yahweh. Hello? Then he said, and when your obedience is full, we we'll judge us on the outside. So we judge on the inside. Show said, judge among yourselves. It's in your Bible. So how you got church? We now tell you judge not. When the commandment is there to judge. What are you suffering as? What are you suffering for? Are you even suffering? Those who are not suffering are those who are functioning efficiently outside. On the outside of the household. You are out there like a sinner. You are out there being like the world. You are out there meddling and mingling with the wicked, deceptive, lying people. So you fit perfectly in their circle. You're not an offense to them. So you're not being judged for anything. Are you being told, you look in the church and say, you all don't judge. Uh-huh, we shouldn't. When the book says we must judge on the inside, we must judge.
That's what it states. Judgment has begun. And it begins in the household of Yahweh. And the normal behavior now for most of you, most of you I encounter, is that you are easily offended and you feel judged. Well, you are judged because the pastor has to tell you and the apostle and prophet and whoever it is has to come to you also nicely. I mean, no, I'm sis, I'm not judging you. I am judging you. So get it, get with it. If you, if your conduct is ridiculous, I am. I'm not telling you, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging you. I'm just here to talk to you. No, 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 no. I am here to judge you. So deal with it. You don't like it, then go. Because judgment begins here. Sanil said it. Anyone who says don't judge me has something they're doing. They don't want to be rebuked for it. Thank you, Sandal. Absolutely true. I announce to you prophetically that those of you who receive this truth, who abide by this truth, who walk according to Yahweh's word presented to you today, you shall be met with an intensification. I'm talking from those who are in the household now, who sit inside. You'll be met with an intensification of anger from them because you stand for what is right. You'll be shocked at how some people respond to what you tell them. But don't be because you're being warned right now. You'll be surprised at how people who are on this broadcasting, their saints, respond when you tell them about what is righteous and what they ought to do. You are commanded to judge those on the inside. You're not asked to do it if you think it's necessary. It is a command, an apostolic instruction written in scripture. And the wicked are telling you, judge not. And then they say to you that they think that apostle is too, I, I, apostle is too judgmental. Why must he be like that? Why must he be so judgmental? I am judgmental because judgment has begun. I tell you, I don't care what people say. That's, that's why, that's why it is so easy for me to function this way. Because I don't care what you say. Once I could see that it's documented or I could hear it, through the spirit. You could talk, you could holler, you could cry, you could whine, you could pout, you could do what you want, you could even walk away. It will not change my posture because the righteous are not governed by your response. They're guided by the spirit of truth. Your response is not the spirit of truth. I don't have to have agreement for me to know them right. Judge them. Because in the same text it says, if the righteous could barely escape this, and it's so hard for the righteous, what will happen to those on the outside? So it's clear. If somebody who claimed to be in the household can't take the judgment, then they're from the outside. Because those who are in the household can handle the judgment. Since you're not suffering as an evildoer, you're not suffering as one who's a murderer, you're not suffering as a thief, you're not suffering as a busybody. Therefore, you don't have a problem. But those who are suffering through the judgment. Oh, bling, yeah. He used without sin cast the first stone. Judge not. Oh, that's their favorite line. He, and I'm talking about people in the church. Yahweh, you are faithful. Your ways are never ever beyond comprehension when it comes to the righteous because your spirit teaches us your way. The time has come for saints to understand that you can suffer for being righteous or suffer for being unrighteous. You need to know why you're suffering. And if you're not suffering at all in reference to how the world treats you, then you are of the world. I bid you shalom. And I warn you again that you will see, you will see an, a surge 
in how people respond to you? And some of you will be surprised that how could you even react like this to my telling you what is right? Pay attention. Pay attention. There will be a surge in their response. It will shock you. But you've been warned. Judge. Note I didn't say judge not. Judge. For the time has come. Hashtag judge. Put it out there. So, so they know who they're dealing with now. Hashtag judge. Because the time has come, saints, for judgment. That was written way back. Judgment to begin. Where? In the household. We can only tell that you're gold if we judge your mineral composition. If you're lazy, you'll be judged as being lazy. You'll not be judged as being industrious because you're a saint. You're a lazy person who calls yourself a saint. That's how the, that's, that's the kind of arena you're in right now with me. You're not going to be lazy and I call you industrious. If you're lazy, you're a lazy person who calls yourself a saint. You're slothful, so you'll be broke. You get the picture yet? That's how you talk to them when you're dealing with them. If you are a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of your hand, that's how your money will drift from you. Poverty will overtake you. You'll be, you'll be a saint, but you're broke because you're lazy. So don't come to me for anything if you're lazy. Then they'll be mad at you. Because this is time to judge. I love you all. And I'm so grateful, as always, for the kindness you've shown to me. And you continue to show to my family. It remains something that I'm extremely grateful for. Saints, I thank Yahweh for you. That I never have to beg a soul for anything. I am grateful. For you've obeyed his commandment. You've obeyed his instruction. That those who feed you that which is spiritual. You give to them that which is tangible and natural. And for that I am grateful. But it doesn't mean I wouldn't judge. If you behave in a silly manner, I'll deal with you for doing it. You walk away, then go ahead. It's not goodbye, it's go ahead. My father said, rebuke and rejoice. <laughs> rebuke and reprove a loud son. Let the wickedness in high places be exposed. Let the saints stand up for righteousness. Bless, blessings and shalom. Thank you so much, Daddy. I'm so grateful. And I will only do that which I've been called to. So thank you all saints. Do well. Hashtag judge. Bye-bye.